Growing up in the 90s and 2000s is a great time for fantasy fans. With all the banger Disney cartoons to Dragonheart and Army of Darkness, we were pretty spoiled. Within the same year, 2001, we got the two big daddies of fantasy literary adaptations, with Harry Potter and Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. Both of you could argue are great movies, but PJ's Lord of the Rings you could make a case for being an absolute masterpiece. With those years of films, we also got dozens and dozens of movie tie-in games. Now, typically licensed games are shovelware trash that are released in conjunction to the film in order to capitalize on the hype and make a quick buck, but they usually end up being hollow copy-paste pieces of junk. But the Lord of the Rings was different. The PS2 and Xbox games, Two Towers and Return of the King are still regarded as some of the best, even though when you really boil them down, they are quite simple games. There was one, however, that glued itself to my radar. The Battle for Middle-Earth. A strategy game based on Lord of the Rings? Hell yes! For every movie, there was a book game too. The Lord of the Rings had War of the Ring. The Fellowship game was not tied to the films, and the Hobbit game, which I've been meaning to try, was a standalone experience altogether. Battle for Middle-Earth was a dream, worked on by Titans, who also had a finger in the soup of games like StarCraft and Warcraft 3. How does it hold up? Well, Battle for Middle-Earth is a really solid game. Terrific visuals, sound, and music straight out of the film, even with many voice actors reprising their roles. You really feel like you're replaying the films from a bird's eye perspective. How does this game differ from standard RTS games? Well, instead of base building, the game has pre-placed building plots where you can only build on certain points. So if you're wanting to utilize your entire tech tree with a stable economy, you will need to expand. There is only one resource, and that is resources. And it is gathered from economy buildings, and certain heroes have abilities like getting money per kill. These economy buildings you also have to build on plots, and they just tick over time. The game also has a strong emphasis on siege warfare, which I love. Forces of good start with manable walls, fit with build slots for towers and parapets for archers, where evil has siege works with ladders, bombs, and rams, just like in the films. I love these mechanics. I have always been a fan of manable walls in RTS games. What is cooler than having archers rain arrows down on people below as they scramble up to attack you? Stronghold is probably the best example in this regard. Unfortunately, it isn't very viable in a PvP respect. Age of Empires 4 added manable walls with towers, ladders, and the like, but you will rarely see them utilized how you would expect online. No rams or towers here, just long-range catapults and cannons. A shame, but the meta is the meta. So the last big difference would be that units are trained in squads, a lot like Dawn of War 2. In, in fact, Battle for Middle-Earth 2 is on the same engine as the later Command & Conquer series. Good usually has smaller, stronger squads, whereas evil has larger, more fragile hordes to make the battles a little bit more cinematic. So let's answer the question. Can you beat Lord of the Rings Battle for Middle-Earth 1 deathless? Eh, almost. As far as I've seen, I could not find anyone who attempted this before, so I'm going to have to figure out the rules for myself. I will try to beat the entire good campaign without losing a single soldier. Not squad, soldier. This leaves two big variables, summons and bannermen. Each player has god powers essentially, so you can cast a global heal, add a location buff, or stun, and or even summon reinforcements. Good has things like eagles, elves, and the army of the dead, but do these count as units? In Warcraft, summons die at the end of their timer, but this game they kind of either fade away or leave. So do they legally die? They do not count towards your population at the bottom of the map, and they are extremely powerful. I decided to avoid summons as best as I could, to try and go as pure ground army as I could. Now, Bannermen. Full disclosure, this game is fucking hard, especially on hard difficulty, and I just couldn't beat it. So I had to turn it down to normal. Hard difficulty is just too hard for my small peasant brain and old man hands, so I went on normal, but the Bannermen are still an issue. The AI just gets blatant cheats on hard anyways. Another mechanic is units and buildings level up in this game, but we will get to that later. When units level up, they get a bannerman and can resurrect dead squad mates. This is a problem because the bannerman has a one-tenth of the stats of a normal soldier, stands out in front of the squad so it's the first to be targeted, and in cavalry's case, literally die to impact with an unupgraded Urukai. I was struggling even on the second mission as Rohan. 
since the only units that you get that are any good are cavalry, and the bannerman literally dies to touching any hostile unit, and I cannot stop units from leveling up, there ain't no Everstone in the Westfold. I was resetting every time a bannerman died, and it was torture for me and the viewers, so we agreed on a rule. Bannermen aren't people, and screw them. Individual units count in the population of command points. Because of this, you can cheese the limit. With, say, five weakened squads, you can build a fresh one, and then when they all heal, you'll have 60 units instead of 50. Bannermen do not count to this population. Command points don't increase or decrease with their deaths, and since I cannot choose whether I get a bannerman or not, we all decided to call it. Bannermen's lives do not matter here. And besides, when a regular unupgraded soldier has 50 health and a bannerman has 5, Ugh, you, you, gotta, you gotta give me a break here. So how do you play this game now? The licenses are all fucked up and there is no digital release for any of the Lord of the Rings games, so I'll show you. The link to a launcher is in the description. And from here, you simply turn it on, choose whatever game, and it downloads and plays whatever patch you want. It even works with Battle Familiar 2. You can even install mods here too, apparently. I personally recommend either the Age of the Ring or Edain. These mods are truly, truly incredible. There is a fan patch that tweaks balance and adds things like different in-game cutscenes and events, but I decided to play the game as pure as the original as I could. Original balance, original bugs. So, with that out of the way, let's see how it goes. Level 1, Moria. This is the best part about being the forces of good. The heroes. Heroes are crazy good in this game, but they aren't immortal. And some heroes are obviously better than others. Legolas, I'm pretty sure, is broken in every form of media he is in, but that is a good thing for me. So a theme with the movie tie-in games is they don't spend too much time on lore or exposition. In fact, they rely on you having seen the movies to understand what is happening. There is no dialogue between characters, barely a mission briefing, and no characterization whatsoever. Case in point, this game starts in Moria. So if you haven't seen the movies or know anything about the books, you're not going to have a goddamn clue what is going on. But if you wanted to play a nice looking strategy game, at least it's fun. So, we have to make our way through Moria, which has the Fellowship do a lot more fighting than in the films. We killed dozens of goblins before we even reach Balin's tomb. This mission has some secondary objectives. Collecting these relics levels up heroes by one, which is solid. I recommend leveling melee heroes, since ranged heroes spank so much ass they won't need it. A decent threat is trolls and hobbits. Well, hobbits are hobbits. You can't expect them to be OP heroes, and they can and will get one-shotted by a well-placed troll rock. I actually have to reset here, because a fool of a took gets hunted by a rock. Cut through the trolls and gobbos, and then face off with the balrog. On hard, this guy is on a rampage, and Gandalf can only hurt him with lightning, so run around and wait for the cooldowns. Use heal when you need it. This game, you can change the cannon, though. Killing the Balrog brings Gandalf with you. However, losing him in the mine doesn't keep the game going. That actually could have been neat. Level 2, Lothlorien. Lothlorien is a pretty level. The Fellowship are getting chased by gobos to the Elven Forests. So, here you get the best archers in the game, the Galadrim, or Elven Warriors as the game states. Here, you just hunker down and fight off waves of goblins or trolls at two bridges into the base. The heroes really help here, but do get low before you know it. Trolls are nasty and even throw fellow goblins as weapons. Be careful not to lose archers to a stray hit. This game has a lot of one-shot attacks. It takes one or two resets, but is easy enough. Level 3, Amon Hen. Great scene in the film, and a hero-only level, which means it's pretty much a free win. There is a bonus objective to save Boromir here, which is pretty hard to fail. But bring your heroes, save them, and kill Lurtz. Massive battle at this crossing occurs with berserkers and trolls, but micro your heroes and you should be okay. Luckily, this game has auto-casting abilities. It never tells you this, but right-clicking certain powers and heroes works just like Warcraft 3, and allows you to cast at their wills. This is handy since you have 9 or more heroes at a time to micro. Level 4, Eves of Fangorn. This is where we have to bring up another point. This game is great, but it is also a little light on depth in both strategy and in the narrative. This game comprises 11 story missions for the forces of good, with most missions spaced out by a series of skirmish matches with secondary objectives. We now get control of Aomer and his riders, and we need to fight off some Isengard Uruks to progress the story. You get choices where to go, kind of like a Total War global map, with each map getting a different reward and having some secondary objectives. 
These actually are the hardest levels to beat Deathless, as you are simply playing a hard skirmish match where the enemy has a starting force and sometimes gimmicks to deal with. The first one, for example, has random peasant squads that need rescuing, which means easy to die units. I get around this by trying to rush the enemy bases when I can, skirt around the enemy guards and knock out the production. They get unlimited resources and can micro like a bastard, so raiding resource points won't do you any good, and units will constantly stream through their buildings. I almost think they have faster build speeds too, but I haven't confirmed this. Aylmer, he kind of sucks too. I mean, he's a melee hero, so he's obviously going to have a problem, uh, but he does eventually have a gain money per kill power and a fairly strong ranged spear throw, but on horseback is easily countered by pikemen and on foot attacks too slow to beat enemy Uruks when he's surrounded. He only hits one unit at a time too. His only advantage is his speed. And when you level him up enough, he does buff nearby Rohirrim, but in the Deathless run, it's not too handy. This is where I discovered I need to change the difficulty and make the rule on Bannerman. I just couldn't make any headway. If I didn't rush the enemy, I could not beat these guys in a macro match Deathless. The thing that makes skirmishes worth it though, is the units stay with you between missions. They keep their levels and upgrades, and you can even name them. We had some fun naming the units after the chat and seeing how many kills they would get or even if they would survive the campaign. So you might be thinking, why not just farm the first level, knock out any production and just get all the upgrades? Well, first off, your tech tree isn't fully unlocked all the way at first. So your first level, you don't even get an armory. And two, the enemy scales with your starting army. So bringing elite full population armies into a mission means the enemy starts with an elite army as well. Which makes sense, so they don't get rolled every time you just start with 10 upgraded Rohirrim and they start with no base. So, these skirmish missions are just pains overall, so I'll skip over them, for the most part. It just involves rushing or turtling and then spamming powers. Normal is a lot more reasonable than hard, as you'd expect, so these missions are just ways to farm XP for heroes and getting some bonuses at the end. Just a way to pad out the run time of the game. So. Eves of Fangorn, yes. This level you get a fresh new base, which is annoying as you start with unupgraded units, which I should mention that. So, upgrades in this game are not global like in most other games. In Age of Empires, you buy chemistry and boom, every archer gets fire arrows forever. In Battle for Middle Earth, you buy the upgrade, you then have to purchase individual upgrades per unit. So, you can invest in a small upgraded elite force or mass a pile of unupgraded plebs to swarm your enemy. This has its own series of problems, which we will get into later. Another point of contention for me is the lack of details. See, when I play strategy games, I like to know what everything does and how well it does it. How much health does this unit have? How much damage does it do? Does it do damage to a specific type of unit? In Battle for Middle Earth, you get no details. On units, you have plus 30% armor. Plus 30% to what? Zero? One? Ten? What does an armor do? How does armor calculate? How does damage calculate? Plus 50% damage against monsters? Well, how much damage does he do to the monsters in the first place? How much da what damage does what to monsters? It's just little things like this that really help make the game seem more deep and make it a little bit more competitive. The fan patch, which this footage is representing, does add some details like 15 damage or 40 armor, but it's still very vague. Vanilla. Battle for Middle Earth doesn't even tell you how much health your units have or what kind of stats they have. It's a bit annoying. But for now, that means Aomer, who we have been leveling up, is on his way and we need to free the Ents and Hobbits from Orcs in the Forest. Ents are the siege units for Rohan. They can melee, throw rocks, and are prone to... fire. Really prone to fire, as in one fire arrow and the whole tree lights up, spazzes out for a while, and then will take damage until you walk through water. I actually didn't realize this until replaying this for the video, but you can garrison your archers into outposts and shoot out the windows. Only outposts, buildings with the three plots, not the main citadels. Main camps or castles, no dice unfortunately. This will be very handy for protecting your borders while also leveling the archers inside. This level wants you to destroy lumber mills, and for every mill you get an ent, so you can bully the orcs and beat the level, but we are going to wait for Aomer. Elmer has Rohirrim mounted arches with fire arrows, which will make most of these levels possible. Arches are pretty great in this game overall, and with fire arrows, they can even blow up buildings fairly easily. Ents have a melee attack, but they also do trample damage. Most big creatures do, so it's better to just walk through the hordes as opposed to watching the inconsistent animations kill one or two orcs per hit. 
Once Aomer arrives, use him and the Ents to snipe key structures. Be wary of Gar Towers. These things shoot arrows quick and they never miss. Leave these guys up long enough and you will lose units. Level 5. Helm's Deep. After a few more skirmish maps, we finally reach the most anticipated level in the whole game probably. What is probably the most incredible fantasy battle ever put to film translates really well into the game. Helm's Deep. We all know how this works. Defend the fortress until Gandalf turns up. There will be ladders, eventually a bomb, and arrows and ballistas. Let's go. This is where a big gripe I have is building levels. Buildings level up just like units do, but whereas in the sequel buildings level up via purchasing an upgrade, this game requires you to use the building to gain levels, which means to get access to the better units like elven archers, you need to buy three units of their trash tier yeoman archers. Take Gondor for example. They have two infantry units, soldiers and tower guards, who are your primary anti-cavalry. Tower guards need a level 2 barracks, so if the enemy rushes cavalry, you need to make three squads of soldiers who are countered by cavalry in order to level up your barracks to get anti-cavalry units. So now you need three units of soldiers who don't be cavalry, but now you have wasted five minutes and the money to get the ability to start making counter units and you are stuck with them, and command points are very valuable in this game. So now you have a third of your command points tied up with shitty archers just so you can get elves and fire arrows. This is something the fan patch fixes. In that patch, you can send your units to your command base and recycle them for money, freeing up your population, but also giving your investment back on buying shit units. Before, we could only suicide them into the enemy base, which would also feed their experience and power points. Doing this also alerts your enemy as to your strategy, as if you want to go elves, you have to suicide yeoman archers, so imagine you're playing StarCraft. The enemy makes an armored unit. Oh, you should make marauders. Oh, but you can't make marauders because you need to make five marines first to unlock the ability to make marauders. And then by the time you get marauders, the enemy's blown up your barracks, so you have to build a new one and build five more marines. It just doesn't work, and I feel like the idea was sound on paper, but applied to the game, it just doesn't work. Which, as you'd expect, is why they took it out in the sequel. This also helps when, say, your army is full, but you need fire arrows to do any reliable damage to buildings with your archers. But since population is full, you can't train the three yeomen to upgrade the building. Alas, we are stuck in the vanilla game, so that means I need to choose one level to get fire arrows and ensure all my guys are upgraded and just hope I never get fresh archers in the future. So, after the elves turn up, I change up the strats. There's really no need to guard the deeping wall here. Put all farms in the back lot and then bring all units into the Hornburg. This is the same strat in Battle for Middle Earth 2 skirmish map of the same name. This means the enemy will group up and come straight into a kill box on this one little intersection of wall here, or your main gate. I bring my heroes out to the bottom of the map because eventually peasants will come running, soon chased by wargs. These heroes kill the wargs and now you have useless ass peasants sucking up your fucking food supply, so put them in your base. Once the main host arrives, don't worry about the outer defenses and micro legolas to attack the Uruk crossbows. Them and ballistas will be your threats here. I put my heroes in the choke points too and even leave the main gate open. This splits the enemy so instead of them all going up the ladders, they decide to funnel into the main entrance too. Building wells and statues increases your attack and defense, so just sit tight. Occasionally, their crossbows get a cheeky kill, so just pay attention to the command points if they ever go down. Keep up with heals and snipe those crossbows. Eventually, they will set off the bomb, just like in the movie, which hilariously only damages themselves. This is where calling in Gandalf causes me to pause. More units means more potential for deaths. Instead, I wait for the enemy scripted waves to stop. Then they will only send unupgraded units from their camps. Bring out my platoon of heroes and slowly eat through. Eowyn. Oh, Eowyn. One of the best female characters with a badass moment in the films doesn't translate here. She is kind of junk with stupid abilities like disguise. What the fuck? Why would I need to disguise in case the enemy sees a lone Rohirrim rider and thinks she is a standard soldier, even though she rides a white horse? It basically just puts a helmet on her anyways. I think in the fan patch they give her like a plus 25% bonus to armor or something, but pff, it's pretty silly. She dies super easily too. In fact, most of the Rohan heroes are kind of crap compared to the Fellowship. It's cool having Boromir here too. Makes you wonder how the battle would have gone with him there. However, where's Haldir? The fan patch adds him in, which is great. He's a good ranged hero who actually buffs elves. It's just too bad there wasn't more dialogue or any kind of alternate cutscenes with Boromir in there. 
Eh, but hey, they did what they did. My problem here is the ballistas. These things are nasty. Every shot kills at least one unit, and the enemy literally doesn't stop pumping them. I actually call in Gandalf after the first bases go down, and use his forces to destroy the siege orcs so I work away at their defenses. Once the camp goes down, victory. Level 6. Isengard. This scene was so hype as a kid. The trees fight back. This level, you're supposed to just rampage through the base, squashing orcs. But I like fromage, so I bring my whole forest up to the top of the map, pop open the wall here, and butt rush the dam. You don't actually need to destroy the dam to steal enough damage to cause it to pop. Takes a couple tries and Saruman gets unlimited fireballs here, but I get lucky with placement and knock it out super quick. Level 7. Northern Athelion. We now move across the world to the realm of Gondor. Gondor seems a lot more versatile than Rohan. They actually have proper infantry, pikemen, solid archers, and cavalry, and siege. We take control of Faramir and the Hobbits just after the Tater's Precious scene with the Haradrim moving towards Mordor. That means Mumakil and Harad Javelins. This is where the game shows off more of its fire mechanic, meaning setting a Mumakil on fire will make them rampage, killing anything in their path, which could cause problems for a Deathless run. The problem with this mechanic is it's too inconsistent. With Ensign Mumakil, it is almost guaranteed to set them ablaze, which makes them very unreliable units. Also, Fire Arrows can just nuke a Mumakil before they even have a chance to fight back. Which is a shame, Mumakil are super cool and you can garrison archers on top of them with either Orcs or Hurrah to add spice. The balancing in this game, it isn't great. Faramir is a solid little hero, way better than Denethor would admit. He has a bow, a sword, and can ride a horse with a great anti-monster arrow with solid range. Frodor and Sam do fine here too. I try to level Sam up as much as possible. He will be very handy later, which is cool here. What is cool here is the Pool of Athelion. You can train some of your best troops from here, and they can get the Fire Arrows upgrade, which means Rangers and Fire, so I should build as many as I can. Flame up the Mumakil in this semi-scripted events until you get a base. Here you're supposed to set up an ambush, just like in the film, as a massive Harad and Mumakil force comes through, but I just build all towers in my camp, which has walls, and lure the enemy convoy to me. Then you need to destroy this Mordor base to win. What I didn't realize until after this is, you can avoid the convoy altogether. Instead of taking the first base, you can just go straight for the enemy end camp and kill them. Once their camp goes down, the mission actually automatically ends. You can skip the convoy altogether. Level 8, Oz Giliath. Alright, this is the turning point. The game has been challenging, but possible until now. Just like in the films, this battle is hopeless, deathless. It is one of those start under fire missions. You have three bridges with weak units that are immediately under attack, and I mean there is an unskippable in-engine cutscene watching your units literally die. I reset, try to skip, try to crash and break the game in order to get control, but nada. This level just does not want you to live. I even played the fan patch version of this, and you actually get way better units to guard the bridges, but still, I cannot get out with no deaths. The best I could do was one soldier death on the fan patch. One. On vanilla, almost a whole squad of archers gets run over by trolls before you can even use my mouse. So no, I, myself, cannot beat this game deathless. But I do feel like there is something to this. Maybe someone smarter than me can figure out how to break the scripting, but with my skill level, I cannot do it. So... I decided to make the exception for this one unit, and try not to lose anything after I get control of the game. And it's still a tricky one. The enemy attacks constantly, but with weak troops, and there are catapults down here that shoot skeletons which scare units away. I get a little lucky, and the catapults all just kind of chill on the bridges, so I build up some towers and garrison the bridge towers and get consistent kills, keeping me safe. Faramir soon arrives, and we can move out. The threat here is the Nazgul flyers who insta-kill almost everything they touch. I have to lure them and overkill them before they swoop. Easier said than done, and these bastards are tricky too. Sometimes I lure one here, and on a second, they bypass the bridge and strike my trebuchets in the back. The enemy really doesn't like trebuchets, and will beeline straight across the map towards them. I probably don't need trebuchets here, as my rangers out-DPS them even with buildings, but these trebs are handy for those little sentry towers at the enemy camps. I also have to be careful of level 3 buildings. All level 3 buildings, at least when the enemy uses them, shoot arrows at your units. 
little wasp arrows that eventually get kills. Eventually, I am able to slowly punch my way through, wiping the Nazgul and claiming victory in defeat. Kirith Ungol. This one had me worried. It's Shelob's lair, followed by an attack on the fortress of Kirith Ungol. So, we get Sam Chadwick here and are expected to free Gondorian soldiers from webbing in order to fight Shelob and the orcs. I don't recall this from the film, but it makes sense for a strategy game. So, we need to rescue Frodo with Sam Chadwick, and to do that, we need to slay the child of Ungoliant Shelob. I decide not to rescue the soldiers here. They are just liabilities at this point, so I sprint straight to Shelob's lair, which actually doesn't take very long since you're ignoring the soldiers, and here we go. The fog of war opens up, and it's the boss fight. Usually, I would try to fight fairly, but a viewer gave me an idea. In the film, Smeagol says she eat orcses, which makes me wonder, will she eat these orcses? All of the hobbits actually have a stealth ability, which I never found much use of until now. So let's give it a try. Aggro Shelob and run Sam past this outpost, across this bridge, and then as he starts taking damage, and Shelob is close enough, stealth. This will make him invisible and stop all aggro, and it works. Shelob, hungry for death, goes on a rampage and starts eating this massive garrison, but they do not fight back. The orcs seem to be totally fine with just getting murdered one after the other after the other. With Shelob having a right bloody feed, we bring Sam back to this outpost, build three towers, and wait. You can actually garrison Sam in this tower who will throw stones at nearby enemies. So sit tight and let Shelob eat all the orcs and their pits. She even eats their buildings. All of a sudden, though, she stops. She gets a little confused with stairs, so I try to fix her aggro with Sam, but she seems well satisfied. She makes her way back home, and this is where my towers and Sam shine. They just slowly poke away at her until she finally dies. Bring Sam in and destroy the pits. You only need to destroy the buildings to win. And with that, we have defeated Kirith Ungol with barely any kills and zero deaths. A neat solution to what I think would have been a very hard level. No deaths! I like to think Sam went back and rescued all the Gondorian soldiers after the film's events. Minas Tirith. City of Kings. With that, we withdraw to Minas Tirith. This is the next big siege map, and man, it looks amazing. We have to hold out until our Rohan forces arrive, and we have Gandalf, Pippin, and Boromir. The brothers unite! It would make sense, too, if he was still alive to bring Boromir along with Pippin. Unfortunately, since the game focuses so little on story, we don't get an exclusive cutscene of Boromir and Faramir reuniting and catching up with the old times or even Denethor, who I don't even think is mentioned in this game. This is just like Helm's Deep. You get a few minutes to prepare, so I will do the same kind of thing. Abandon the outer walls, just bring all archers to the inner wall, and it's too bad you can't put them on this big landing overlooking the city. In place of all the building plots on the outer walls and rings, I build towers. I thought about trebs, but wondered if they would count as units. They don't count as population, but meh. Let's just ignore them this time. Their targeting is not great anyways, and the enemy snipes them way too easily. When the battle starts, it doesn't go too bad. However, my archers still take some hits from their archers later on. The enemy comes with hordes and hordes of level 10 units, which even for orcs is scary. I leave the main gate open, and the enemy mostly funnels in through here and up some of the towers. The entire outer wall is covered with towers here, and my guard towers do barely any damage, but they auto-target them, making things a little annoying. The rest of the enemies get whittled down, trying to get into the second level where I've placed Gandalf. Just sit tight and hold a storm. Eventually, it's going to look like the goddamn apocalypse is upon the city with dozens of catapults just bombarding everything, but really, they all choose an attack ground spot, usually on a terrain or a building, and just let it happen. They will continually attack the designated spot without changing targets, so as long as you don't move anyone, you should be fine. Eventually, the big daddy Gron turns up. And since the gate is already open, he kind of just chills. Now, Rohan has arrived, and now we gotta deal with Nazgul. After a couple resets, we clear them, and the first camp. But just like in the films, the Haradrim turn up, and bad timing. My forces are split, and level 10 Mumakil with level 10 archers are no joke, and chase my armies relentlessly. I can just about blow up both camps and escape, but two Mumakil split. One heads to the northern force, and the other chases my heroes. A real pain. Eventually, Aragorn turns up with the Army of the Dead. I try to avoid summons, but these fellas come without my call. 
so the level is just about over anyways, so I use them to clean up what's left. The level isn't over until all the catapults and siege towers are dead, so once we clear the walls of Minas Tirith, we can move on, with zero casualties. Level 11, the Black Gate. Well, well, here we go. The Black Gate, time to stall for Frodo to destroy the ring. This will not be a glorious battle from the film. In fact, our army is not going to be very helpful at all. This is a stressful map. The enemy comes in huge waves of max level upgraded troops of all kinds, and we have two little camps and a few rangers. Our heroes here will be doing the heavy lifting, mostly Gandalf. I fall back immediately and build some resources. The Rohan camp just dies right away, but some of the enemies do not get aggro to my position, so I can slowly lure them away and to get picked off. The Gondor camp, I build a stoneworks, which lets me buy Numenorean stonework and arrow tower upgrades, which affects all towers and walls in the camp. Luckily, you don't need to keep the building to keep the effects. Then I build all towers. Gandalf I put on Shadowfax and I use his speed to aggro as many enemies as I can and just run in circles around the camp. This game's AI seems to pick a target and maintain that order until it kills it. I've seen few times of enemies running through other units and defenses to kill that one unit or hero that they are focused on. I use this to my advantage. If you're like me, you will get sick of hearing Gandalf yell, Fly Shadowfax, ride Shadowfax, fly! Every time I order him to move, holy shit, this will get annoying. I especially need Gandalf's kiting when it comes to these trolls. Mountain trolls, when leveled up, become armored trolls, and these dudes do not fuck around. They wipe buildings in seconds, so I ride Gandalf up close, get their attention, and ride in circles and circles and circles. The arrow towers, even with upgrades, are so weak against armor trolls, so this will take a while. I also need to be careful not to let enemies leak off towards my army. They will not be able to beat the trolls without losing a unit. We finally start to make headway until the next challenge comes. Nazgul. And jacked up Nazgul, it seems. These friggin' guys constantly fly to my hidden troops and eke out a kill or two, which forces resets. I can get them all to focus on Gandalf if he is in the area when they spawn in, but they specialize in striking fleeing cavalry units. Gandalf won't last long, and spills are so slow to try and cast. I stop to cast a starry light, and he gets pummeled by either the Nazgul or other units giving chase. Orc archers here are nasty too. A few volleys and I'm fucked. So with luck and a lot of time and resets, we slowly eat away at them until I reach an impasse. Mumukil and Nazgul come both at the same time. Mumukil can literally step on your heroes insta-killing them, so when I try to bring Aragorn and Boromir and the rest of the gang, they just get oofed. Faramir and Legolas can help here sometimes. Sometimes the Mumak run straight for my heroes, sometimes they follow Gandalf. It, it seems these dicks don't follow the focus rule here sometimes as much as others. Nazis, you can actually sort of break. If two or three of them chase Gandalf, they will cancel each other's animations out as they each try to attack, giving you this odd little spaz animation as they follow. The problem is, the Mumaks are still trudging around and usually end up killing Gandalf anyways. Honestly, if these waves were staggered by another, say, three to five minutes, I could probably pull this off, but the combo of Nazgul and Mumakil just brick my progress. So, I finally cave in. After three hours, of fly, fuck off, Shadowfax, fly ass, Shadowfax ass, and dozens and dozens of resets. I finally decide to use my first summon. I've built up enough power points to summon the Army of the Dead. I use the argument that they don't add or subtract to the population, and when they expire, they don't die, as they just... As in, they don't go and die and fall over. They just kind of fade away, just like in the movie. So... We use it. And my god, these guys are so powerful. They wash over the enemy Mumax, Nazgul, and Orcs so easily, it pretty much just insta-wins me the battle. I now only have to survive until Frodo makes it to Mount Doom. Shame I had to use a summon. If I was to reset and try different timings, I definitely think this could be done. But my sanity just couldn't handle it. So the ring is destroyed and the enemy defeated. Will Gondor recover? Will their ten dead archers destroy their economic recovery, giving King Aragorn a challenging term in reconstructing the West? 
I think they'll be fine. Rohan suffered no casualties, save for the wussy bannermen, so don't sign up for the army if they have bannermen openings. So there we have it. No, I personally could not beat Battle for Middle-Earth 1, Forces of Good, Deathless. I do think there is something here, though. If someone was able to break Osgiliath, it could be done. Just sucks it was a scripted moment, too, that I had no control over, kind of like those sappers in the Orc campaign of Warcraft 2. Ah, well, let's try the other campaign. Can you beat the forces of evil, Deathless? <laughs> no, no, you can't. Fucking nope. Moving on. Thanks for watching. If you want to play Battle for Middle Earth 1 and 2, the link to the launcher will be in the description. It is literally so simple to get running. Happy New Year and enjoy. See you on the next one.